for us, it's about we travel rather than me travel. So it's about, and we travel, what I mean by that, it should be better, the, the experience should be beneficial to both the traveler um, as well as the local communities and both the people and other living being, beings within those lo local communities as well as the ecosystems. Have you ever dreamed of having unparalleled access to the culture, people, and mouthwatering vegan cuisine of such faraway lands as India, Thailand, or Indonesia? Ever wanted to step off the beaten path and experience an exotic locale in an authentic way, generally reserved for locals? Well, our guest today can provide precisely what you are looking for and more. Zach Lovas is the co-founder of Vegan Travel Asia by Veg Voyages, a vegan cultural adventure tour company operated by five close friends that come from four different countries and have four different faiths, bringing you an immersive experience that will leave you enriched and forever changed. It was Zach's strong background in the film industry that brought him to India initially, which brings us full circle because it's another reason why we're very excited to have him here today to discuss his work on the very gutsy documentary, Ma Ka Dude, that takes a critical look at India's dairy industry. Welcome to the show, Zach. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much. And thank you for the very nice intro. It's, it's great to be here with you both. Oh, well, thanks. Oh, man. It, you know, I in the research, we, we found out that you grew, out, grew up in Orange County. Mm -hmm. And that's where I live. Where in, where in Orange County? Okay. Uh, originally Mission Viejo. And then uh, the last part before I left Orange County and went to LA was in Tribuco Canyon. Of course. Yeah. I've cycled my bike through there maybe thousands and literally yes. thousands of miles. <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> it's beautiful. But uh, it is a far, far cry from India, where you went to live and work on a film when you were just 18. And I mentioned your background in the, in the film industry that started when you were young. But I'm curious what drew you so far away from home at, at such a young age. You could certainly make films in Los Angeles. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, that's actually, it's a very good question. It's, it's kind of a long answer, but I'll keep it short. Um, when I was growing up in Orange County, um, it, it, Orange County's changed quite a bit, and I would say from the positive, uh, more so than when I was growing up in it. Um, and uh, so it was a, the most, um, I think at that time was ranked as one of the most conservative counties in the United States. Um, and you know, you, 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 you were there. I, I'm not sure if you were there back in that time, but, um, yeah. but no, okay. So yes, it's, 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 it went, it's grown a lot. And I say that in a positive way. It is a little I'm more purple sure. now. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, what it was, so a lot of the values that I had or that I was thinking, even as a kid, when you start becoming aware of them, was kind of very much contradictory and not in the conformity of the county that I was growing up in, the society that I was growing up in. So I always had felt very much out of place. Um, and so much so that even um, when I finally, when I finally uh, decided like, like we do when we Turned 14, um, you, we, we tend to rebel, but this I think was a rebelling in a, in a, in a positive way. Um, it was to become vegetarian. And then at that time also, I could make some um, more independent decisions. And I decided that I want to get to leave school early. I'll do the independent study. And then since I was had some AP classes and all that, I could get the credits and then get out and then uh, uh, get away. And, and I did like many people did is I ran away to Hollywood. Um, and to get in the film business and 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 that so I, I was basically running from Orange County, then I got to Hollywood, and then uh, I, I was uh, working as a writer writer for children's television um, and in production and uh, and the same reason I got into film for the same reason many people do is I, a lot of us do is that I thought I could change, you know, we could change the world with it we could make a positive impact and change the world. Um, and then. Um, then we realize then you start realizing you know everything starts kicking in and you're like well it becomes more about the business rather than actual the story and what have you um and then uh, so then there was an opportunity on a film to go to india um and 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 i said i would um i would love to go obviously that uh to, to 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 get it was getting further away from where i was uh, uh i i felt i didn't belong so then i went to india on a film, and um, and I've been in Asia ever since. Was it a film that you thought could change the world, and did um, it? You know, I, I I did, I did at that time, but it, um, yes, <laughs> I did. But I, I I also did it no. Um, so I, uh, but at the same time, what it did do is when I went on the film, 
uh, I was, th th like you were saying, a, a kid from Orange County, a conservative Orange County. Um, and then I went to India and the place that I was, uh, when I first went there and I lived and uh, was based, was in a small village um, outside of a place called Trichy, and it was a Sufi village. Um, so Sufism, which obviously, again, coming from conservative, uh, uh, cr very Christian at that time, Orange County, um, and a lot of the born again movement and everything was moving. I, I was in a Sufi village, and then I was right next door to a Sri Lankan Tamil refugee camp. Um, and, uh, and where I was staying was in this like boarding house. It was a concrete building. I was living there in this very, my first night in this very simple, concrete room, very simple, uh, basically just one bed. There was a, a hole, uh, uh, what at that time seemed like just a hole in the ground for the bathroom on the side, and then uh, uh, windows with no glass, and uh, you know just uh, like a couple bars and the wood thing to open up. There was mosquitoes, the temperature, there was no climate control, obviously no AC, nothing like that. And, uh, and something in my head said, you know, everything right now should be telling me I should be very uncomfortable, like everybody said that uh, when I got there. Um, and uh, it was actually the first time in my life that evening, and then I realized it even more the next morning where I actually finally felt comfortable with where and who I was. And uh, wow. yeah. So. And how old were you at that time, Zach? 18. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it was early. Because I, I also became vegetarian at 14 and yeah. went to Hollywood. It actually was 18. I was in Hollywood. <laughs> I have not been to India, though. So okay. I'm looking forward to hearing your stories about it. So so you so you're in India and you're a filmmaker. Before we go, I need to be enlightened on Sufism. But it's often it's often uh, categorized, even though it's it's not really a correct categorization categorization of it as being the mystical form of Islam. But it's a very internal uh, form of Islam. Um, so a lot of people say it, uh, if you see if you go to a Sufi temple, especially in India, if you go to a Sufi, a Sufi mosque or a temple, or the, there's uh, actually other words that we would classify it as. Some people would even be confused that it's actually even Islamic, even though it is, it's a, but it's a very more internal uh, form of Islam. And, uh, but that's often categorized as the a mystical form of Islam. Yeah. So you are you were contrasting that with the very conservative yes. Christian uh, Orange County. Yeah, you certainly did make a big switch and found your home. So you, so you were in India at age, age 18 as a filmmaker, but then you decide eventually to found Veg Voyages, which is now called Vegan Travel Asia. Um, tell us, how did you make that transition? Okay, uh, that's a good question. So the uh, same way where uh, we got into, I got into films originally because I thought we could change the world. And then again, it just became a job. And it was one film after another uh, from production distribution, coordinating for, uh, foreign media units. Um, that would come to Asia. And then um, what we did it, at that time, it got to a certain point where um, the projects that I was involved in, uh, if there was like 10 truths that were supposed to come out of that project, the people uh, would look at the three truths that backed up what their preconceived notions were of what that story should be, uh, or, what, um, or what the piece should be, or the film should be, or the news clip should be. And then the other seven truths that contradicted um, or would call in to challenge those street truths, they were not even just put to the side, but just kind of thrown out, I mean, com completely thrown out. So it, it became in, um, it became a, a really a, a conflict because it was like, okay, no longer am I not doing what I thought we could do to make some change, but at the same time, it was also just doing something for money. And at the same time, it was doing something that actually is damaging. Um, you know, when, when we don't full, say the whole truth, and especially when it's in conflict areas or, or, or uh, stories that could create conflict or judgment or, uh, you know, uh, division, then it's like I'm not only taking the money to do it, but I'm also being part of what the problem is. So uh, we said um, at that time, it was like, I'm not getting any, I'm not getting any younger, obviously. And uh, so if I'm not going to make this change now, when? Um, and uh, so it said, okay, the one part I, I still liked and, and, uh, and my partner still liked at that time was bridging the cultural gap uh, between the, uh, the foreign film units that would come in and with the local units. And, and, and seeing that those, those kind of the bridges of understanding build organically between people and all these preconceptions that everybody did. We were even just talking about Sufi Islam, the preconceived notions that I had uh, just on Islam in general, um, obviously, again, growing up in Orange County, California at the time was, was huge. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, those misconceptions were all thrown out. Um, so the same way, when we, would, when we would see those connections between people, the foreign units and the local units, 
Um, that was just, that was really the, the, the only thing I could say that was redeeming about it. And then we wanted to do something that would uh, keep to our animal rights uh, views. And so we thought, okay, well, we could do that. And we love storytelling. We could do storytelling and we could uh, bridge cultural gaps with the, and keep to our animal rights views as well as share those, share those with others and exchange ideas on it. And that's how we came up with uh, Veg Voyages. Was it easy back then to um, attract people to these voyages, it being that maybe veganism was not as popular and people went, oh, I want to travel the world and really eat the cuisine, right? And all this yeah. vegan stuff. Uh, how, what, what were those initial couple of years like? And how did you, uh, you know, pull people in and attract them? Was it more with the experiences? And then it's like, the food's good too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, back then uh, did, uh, we started out as a vegetarian um, just because we didn't, uh, there was like, oh, are we going to be able to get vegans? You know, is there enough vegans that come to be able to do these experiences? Uh -huh. and, then, and then I pressured as quickly as possible to try to get us to get all the trips vegan. So then I turned a couple of them vegan. Um, they were always vegan based and then vegetarian and then they became all vegan. Um, thankfully. And, uh, and, but yeah, I mean, it was more based on the experiences and I could say that I would say over 50% of the people, the people that were traveling with us back then were not vegetarians at all, though they would eat vegetarian uh, food during the trip. Um, but they weren't even veg. I mean, they were, they were, they were non-veg, some hardcore non-veg. <laughs> so, but uh, during the trips and, 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 and even to this day, about 20 to 30%, I would say roughly of our guests, are, uh, are, are non-veg, but they are vegan when they're with us. Um, and they always say right at the beginning, um, because they always, again, preconceived notions people have that we don't really eat, vegans don't really eat, you know, um, we only eat salads and side dishes and it's all bland. And so they always come up usually in the first day or so and say, hey, you know what, look, I may, I may have to duck out on a meal or another meal and they'll go grab something. And then by the time we get to the end of it, uh, and I even will say, because sometimes we have one free night or something where people can go out on their own. And I say, well, this is your opportunity if you want to go out. And they're like, no way. Are you kidding? <laughs> so <laughs> so even during that time, at least, they, they, there's not the missing or the craving, which is good. What, tell us a bit about the countries that your tours explore and what makes your tours different than not only other travel companies, but other vegan travel companies in, in your mind. Okay, um, that's that's a good question. But one of the, the one of the things we like to that we our main I won't even say our focus on it's kind of like one of the foundation of what we do is we we like to create it's uh, it's about we travel not me travel for us it's about we travel rather than me travel so it's about and we travel what I mean by that it should be the the experience should be beneficial to both the traveler um, as well as the local communities and both the people and other living being beings within those lo local communities, as well as the ecosystems. So we basically look at ourselves as a medium for the communities to tell their stories and what they want people to know about their culture, their communities, their history, what they're dealing with, what they've dealt with historically, what they're dealing with now. Um, and why we find that so important is because the more we know about people, the more we understand that we have so much more in common than we do different. The yeah. communities are the ones that are, that are bringing them on these experiences. Um, and in those experiences, and then I, I don't know how much I, I, I said, I, I, I do apologize, cut me off if I'm rambling, <laughs> okay, um, no, that we, we do something that we call it's uh, relatable. R is for religion, um, okay. which is obviously very important. It's been linked by tra trade and tradition, among others. It's helped, as we all know, define, unite, and separate societies and communities equally. It provides a co uh, codes of conduct for living. So R is for religion, E is for eating. Eating and uh, the food and our eating etiquette and everything is basically, you can look in, we learn so much. It's a gateway into people's heritage and cultures, as well as the people that they have been in contact with. Um, L is for language. It's same, same like it with uh, food. There's so much we can learn about a language. And, that's, uh, and, uh, and, and the more languages you learn, the more you realize that how much more similarities we have, um, even in expression, as well as in words, than differences. Um, the A is for arts, and that is obviously from traditional uh, dance to music to folk dances, local artisans, alternative musicians, filmmakers. Um, so basically interacting firsthand with, with the artists, traditions, obviously customs and rituals um, from per, on a personal level, family level, generational community points of view. Very important. The next is attire. Obviously, the way we dress so much 
we can see and also how people have uh, and, and how people dress or traditionally dress, I must say, um, and who is still dressing traditionally in some cultures and who is not. And where it's also kind of, uh, how would you say, blended, infused, again, based on the people that people have been in contact with. Uh, B is for buildings, obviously architecture the same way. There's so much we can learn um, from local cultures about that, as well as the people that they have been with, the conditions that they have lived under, the economies that have developed in those areas. Uh, the next one is very important is learning, education, uh, from educational systems and curriculums. You know, the focus on that, the perspectives and practicalities, methodologies, and why and how we learn what. We even see that kind of transition happening here in the U.S. about what people want people to learn, what they don't want them to learn, um, and all that kind of influence and what is really the truth and what is not the truth and how much of that is kind of developed over the year and taken on its own way and how we teach that, how we get that, who gets access to education as well. And then the last is for etiquette, which comes down to defining traditions, customs, and social structures, which um, the, is basically behind the things of what we do and our behaviors to and, uh, and amongst each other, which is very important. I keep thinking when you're talking about this immersions with all of these cultures of arts and storytelling, how extraordinary it would be uh, as a visitor, as a tourist, as a traveler. But how do you talk these cultures into doing, giving this experience? It, Are they it, just really wanting to tell their stories or do they, do they get something from it themselves? Yeah, well, um, both, actually. The same thing is, is uh, in some of the areas, what we try to encourage is to develop a sustainable tourism program with communities that have not, generally not had tourism. And it also helps develop within those communities among the youth that, hey, let's not just grab to the stuff that we're seeing everywhere on our phones and on the, you know, on the internet and everything like that, which is this, I'm not saying I won't, I'm, I don't, I don't want to come off the wrong way and saying this westernization, kind of a different uh, way of colonialization. But at the same time, there is this, hey, there's a lot of things in your culture and your community you, you have to be proud of. And people want to learn about that. And it's, it's so, on the, the programs that we develop and a lot with the communities, we encourage them to use these same programs for other people. We don't want to say, oh, it's exclusive for us. No, not at all. Uh, we want them to encourage to do uh, these, these programs with others. And, and, and a lot of this is actually we're working like with the, what they would call, consider like in Nepal, they call the mother's group or, the, uh, or women's organizations and what have you uh, to develop these type of programs. Um, so there is a, 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 another source of income that they can have. They also get to share their community traditions and also show the youth that there, there's, there's value in them, not economic value, but value that people do want to learn it. And it is something to be proud of. It's not something to say, okay, well, we got to adapt these quote new ways, you know? So it's kind of, it's multi-level depending on when we are. And are people open to it? Yes. And, so, and, and even the whole idea of vegan, to, we, we actually take it as not just a challenge, but a very pleasant um, experience to be working with a lot of very non-veg communities, because for the first time they start actually opening up and they, to veganism, these ideas and these concepts, but at the same time, even more so, they realize, wow, that's not much different than actually on how we eat or how we've ate traditionally. Tell us the countries that you explore with your clients. Okay, um, but let's see. Uh, the first one, I'll just kind of go in order. Uh, the first one that we started in was in India. We did three trips in India in 2004. Um, and uh, so in India, we're in Rajasthan, in Gujarat, and also in South India is where we have trips. Um, also in Malaysia, in addition to Malaysia and Indonesia, both on the island of Bali and also on the island of Sumatra and also a bit on Java. Um, for the time, these are our current stories. We have more that are coming up. Um, in Thailand, uh, we have uh, uh, two trips, one, and one of them that runs actually over the, what is known as their vegetarian, uh, vegetarian festival, which is a festival based out of Taoism. Um, and then we also have in Laos, uh, uh, stories in Laos, um, also now in Cambodia, uh, in Nepal, uh, two different ones, including one that just started, they're going to Everest Base Camp right now, um, uh, with the Kuntal Joshar, who is the first vegan to ever, uh, to ever summit Everest, which he did twice. Um, and we have our, 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 our trip there called the Himalayan Tale, which is fantastic. It actually, people hear about Nepal, but they don't know how actually diverse it really is and how much history is there and all these cultures and these communities and how they've overlapped and developed. And, and many of them that were coming here from either, either fleeing a famine or hard conditions or conflicts and everything and how they all settled in these foothills and in the, uh, you know, the mid foothills, upper foothills and lower foothills of the Himalayas. 
It's, it's, it's incredible, uh, their stories. And uh, then also in Sri Lanka, and then coming up, Bhutan. Um, and I don't think, I, if I'm, I'm missing anyone, I do apologize, but I don't think I'm missing anyone. <laughs> I feel like he has to be the first recorded vegan to summit because before colonialism, I mean, back in, in the day, right before we recorded anything, there had to be, that's all they ate was vegan food. Yes. And they had exactly. to have made it too tough. Yes, I agree. So he's the right. first the first known vegan. <laughs> so I agree. That, that someone he really, yes. truly yes. knows about. And I'm wondering how, um, have some of the things that you've experienced living abroad at all of these locations around the world have uh, changed or adjusted your, your worldview from Orange County worldview when you were a teenager? Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. And, uh, and, and it's, um, it, it, it's changed drastically, immensely. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, to, I mean, I don't know where really to start, but um, but it it really I I mean I I I bring up this one story because it even relates to uh, even a time in in my in third grade where the kind of the change started happening. Then all the way to now, but in third grade, I'll be real quick. We had, there was a teacher and the teacher uh, was uh, teaching on different religions and said Buddhism is the path of of, of Satan and for devil worshippers and everything. And there was a couple kids in the class that obviously were Buddhist but weren't openly Buddhist. Um, and I was like, and I could see that obviously that affected him. There was a tear running down one of the kids' eyes. Um, oh. and, and then I, so I was like, okay, well, I gotta, let me try to do some research. And when obviously we didn't have Google back then and we didn't have our phones and stuff to go to. So I, I went back to the house, looked, is there any books on Buddhism and to the library and what have you? And then I found, and then I said, okay, what, what, how can I find a quick answer on this? And I said, okay, well, let me look for their equivalent of the 10 commandments, which was the five precepts. And then I started reading the five precepts. And the first one was compassion for all living beings and no killing of living beings. I was like, well, that really doesn't sound like the Satan that I was taught. Right. <laughs> you know? And then the no, the no stealing and no lying. And no, yeah, I was like, wait a second. <laughs> you know, there's a lot in common with the Ten Commandments there, in the terminology. But at the same time, these don't sound like what I was uh, the uh, you know that uh, what I was taught that Satan or devil the devil or devil worshippers should, de devil worshippers should be doing, um, and so from that time on from the third grade I started challenging everything and what was said because and again it wasn't the teacher's fault and I and I like to always see stresses she had probably been taught the same thing and she sure. had been she was taught the same thing by somebody else that taught her the same thing that somebody else had taught her the same thing and it and it just continued on. Um, and uh, sadly, and so I think a lot of these things that we were, I will say, programmed with, that were programmed, whether it's programmed at our schools, at our religious institutions, on the TV, on the ads, everything, you name it, right, um, that are put into our heads, uh, a lot of it is unintentional, and some of it is obviously intentional for selling something, and then some of it for politicians is totally intentional, and so they're guilty of that, but for a lot of people, um, I, I believe it is just unintentionally that they would pass out, I mean, they'll pass on this divisive or hateful information. So from that time on, it continued. And, and then when I went to India, wow. I mean, every almost everything that I was taught growing up was just kind of turned upside down in a good way, in a good way, especially a lot religiously of- Religiously or just uh, or, or religious, lots of different ways? Uh, religiously on how people are, uh, treat each other on that, that actually even- seeing things that were like, wow, this is the same way that our neighbors were back back home. And there was this idea of trying to obviously always make people feel like the other, but sometimes I won't say the other this way, but the other this way. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so, and I mean, we do the same thing, obviously, with all living beings. And I mean, I don't need to preach to the choir here, but how we even say that, okay, you know, uh, animals are incapable of feeling emotion. They don't have, and if they do, it's not the same emotion that we have. It's not on the same level that we have it, you know, um, you know, oh, we're, we're, yeah, I won't, again, without going on too long, oh, there only freedom is over here, only democracy is over here. Oh, I mean, we could go on so many different levels. We're what the best think? country in the world. I love it when I hear that yes. one. The United <laughs> States is the best country. And I think we have a lot of advantages and we're yeah. very lucky to have been yeah. born here, but that doesn't, but we could learn so much yes. from so many other cultures and how exactly. they do it. Yes. Yeah. But like, even like the, the best medical system, the best is, I mean, it's like, come up. there's a lot we can learn from a lot of other people and it's okay. And it's a good thing. And a matter of fact, I found that it starts making though the world seemed kind of so bleak and everything before I went over to Asia because of, again, where I was growing up and how I was programmed. And it just seemed like this was it. 
that's what we're limited to. And this is how it is. And this is how everything is defined. And then I realized, wait a second, all those walls start coming down. And, it, and, and the world looks so much more beautiful outside the box. Mm -hmm. oh, that's lovely. Um, I want to... Uh, I'm torn between getting some travel tips from you and also, but I want to dive into your documentary because I want to make sure that we're able to get to that. Dotsie, what do you, what do you, you tell me where you want to go? Yeah, no, I definitely think we would, we could, I want to do some travel tips too. And, and, and I'm curious to the, like the best travel experience you've ever had. Cause that seems like a question in people's head, what, you know, you've traveled the world over and over and over. And so like just your, your, this top one and why, and, but yeah, so go ahead and ask Alexander, but let the tips after that for sure. Cause people, people want to know, I mean, they're considering yeah. your tours now, like I am. So give Thank me some you. tips. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I have, Definitely. I have a question that a lot of people um, get tripped up on. So you live out of a suitcase. He says on, in your bio, you live out of a suitcase yeah. most of the year. <laughs> and a lot of people, they, um, they get into a routine at home of eating well and exercising and sleeping properly and then they travel and they just throw their routines out the window and they come home actually not as well rested or rejuvenated or as healthy as they could. Um, that's actually a very good question. And, and we, um, we, we support on, on multiple levels, but uh, one thing I can say, we do a lot of eating. Okay. So people do <laughs> put on some weight and I'm okay. sorry, I do apologize for that, but we do try <laughs> to balance it with a fair amount of exercise as far as from hiking and trekking and community walks and, you know, and, uh, and heritage walks and, and biking and you name it. So, um, but at the same time, we do a sufficient amount of eating. <laughs> okay. Um, and just because of the variety, we want to introduce people to all the large variety of, of local dishes, um, which, but, which many of them have been specially veganized, uh, you know, just for us, just for, for, for our guests. Um, but, and then at the same time, balancing on, on kind of the, uh, uh, what time we start, what time we end, making sure there's enough sleep, you know, a little bit, a little bit of everything. But I, I am must say that we are quite guilty of people putting on some weight. So. <laughs> and what about you? What do you do? What is there something you you do every day, no matter where you are, that helps you stay centered? Um, um, good, good question. I do. I'm. A, I do. I practice Tai Chi and Vipassana meditation every day. Like clock, I mean, I would say like clockwork. I don't know exactly what that means, but yeah, <laughs> so, yes, like uh, I, I practice it uh, every day, and that actually helps uh, me, me very much as far as on the uh, on even keeping focused and uh, keeping things, uh, trying to keep everything in perspective. So, and what would be your top three travel tips for someone who hasn't traveled to Asia before? What would they pack? Maybe what would they expect? What would they wear? To just top three travel tips that you think they should know before leaving or do before leaving? Okay, I'm, I'm going to go in reverse. I'm going to go of the top three. I'm going to start with the third one, which is not the most important and go up to the first one. The, the third one, which is important nonetheless, because of the top three is uh, don't pack too much. I mean, it's so easy to either do laundry yourself or get laundry done and, and uh, don't weigh yourself down too much. So, you know, have a, have a two to three, uh, you know, have like, let's say three pairs, three pairs is usually a pretty good number. Um, to rotate things, uh, and uh, and and this uh, is for a, a week away or two weeks. Or? This is for even if you're, I would say, several months away, unless you're going to oh. different climates. See, it, it all depends. If you're going to different climates, then obviously you got to pack a little bit more for this and a little bit more for that. But you don't necessarily can get stuff locally. But on on, an, on another level, if you're going to what's generally the, the same climate as far as a full attire, um, you know, you can keep it to three and comfortably actually rotate things around. And it doesn't mean you need to be spending a lot of time doing laundry. There's a lot of places you can get laundry done. A lot of places you can get laundry done quite economically, where they even do it by the kgs and what have you. Um, and then also in B, uh, you can you can do your laundry yourself real quickly on a pair and then that's ready. So three pairs you can rotate around um, is, if you're going to the same uh, same climate, uh, definitely. Um, and, and again, if you ever go to a place and you find that you don't have that, there is so much shopping options <laughs> You know, when you go to a place now. I mean, even like the hypermarts and everything where you could get a really good deal on something as well as then the kind of the, 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 the mom and pop shops and everything like that. So Anything that you didn't bring, you can find there. So that's that's number one, uh, unpacking. Number two is take the time to do a little research online as far as on learning a bit of the language. Now there is language apps and all that, 
which are great as far as for communicating, but not necessarily for understanding. If you say something into something and it says it out there, you have no understanding actually about what it was being about the reason and understanding kind of the mindset of why we why you're saying that or drawing connections with the language. They're great apps for actually doing direct direct communication, but also just taking the time to do, you know, um, if, even if you have uh, 15 minutes or 30 minutes a day for you know several weeks leading uh, leading up to some uh, someone's trip to just get online and do a little research about that on the history the 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 heritage the culture the language all that kind of stuff just a little bit taking it makes the experience all the better so i would say the third the, the next thing to pack there is knowledge you know knowledge it awareness and that's very important and even helps it again and these are really quick to do is on what vegan restaurants are there and if there aren't vegan restaurants there don't stress it because then if you've learned some of the language and you print it out or have on your, you know, a screenshot on your phone about what some of the dishes are, then you'll be able to communicate that. And depending on the cultures, um, there will be certain specific words or sentences that you could use where people are going to understand that. Um, so that's the next thing is knowledge. So the first thing is three pairs of clothes. Don't, don't overpack. Um, I mean, if you want to take a little bit more, but you know what I'm saying, you can get by easily with three pairs. Uh, the next thing would be uh, the knowledge. And then the, the 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 first thing, which is the most most important outside of your passport, obviously, um, is uh, an open mind and an open heart. I hands down the most important thing that and and you'll be surprised how many times people forget to bring that when they go on holiday or when they go on a trip. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group and tell us what you want. Have you seen any amazing transformations of people, of somebody who might've been really biased again against a country or people or religion and then had yes. their mind and their heart? Can you tell yes. us the story? Yes, many times, many, many times actually. So one of the biggest ones actually we have is uh, between, uh, uh, sadly, because of the misconceptions on Islam. And uh, and Muslims and uh, and we and that has been and and I maybe say that is also quite timely because of we've been doing this for 19 years and obviously if you look back of re reverse in 19 years we know all the different things that have been associated and what the media has put out there and um, and the divisiveness that's in there um, and the preconceived notions that people have brought there even when they don't know that they're bringing them there to see that come down is is beautiful and 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 that is actually on, on too many counts to recognize um an, another one is uh in in laos and, and I'll, this is uh, uh we uh we laos i was working in well before we started uh veg voyages and um it's the most you know per capita the most heavily bombed country in the world it was uh, involved in a conflict that was known as the secret war, which was known as the secret war here, but not there. It was not secret to anybody there, obviously, when you're on the receiving end of that much bombing. Um, and then we actually had, uh, uh, we've had on quite a few occasions, but I'll just bring up this one of people that were actually in the conflict, but, and, and they still had this distrust, but they were, they were coming on the trip because it was not something that they, how would you say, um, were able to necessarily come to terms with. And, and then when they've been there and they've been in these communities, and then in this one instance, a, a person that had uh, who sadly had lost his arm and his sight from an unexploded ordinance. So he wasn't even fighting that. He was, he's, he's young. And, and this was this was an offshoot of the Vietnam War, just yeah, right? Um, and the, yeah. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. So that our listeners know in the in the late 60s, early 70s. That is correct, yeah. And then, uh, and, and when, the the person said to him, I, um, I, I, he broke down and he said, I'm just so sorry. I'm just so sorry that we did this to you. 
and 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 the kid, um, uh, and I say kid because he he's seventeen, um, so the youth, uh, and uh, I won't I won't say his name, but I he's a friend, um, but uh, he started, um, he smiled, he didn't cry, he gave a big smile and said, no, you, you don't you don't need to say you're sorry, that was in the past, you know, we're we're here together now, and you know, and and you don't need to, and he had it with it was such a beautiful smile and genuine and genuineness. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, no, and, and from that time forward, then there was a reflection through the trip that, that we would talk uh, of, of what all these misconceptions and everything and what they were doing and what they thought it was right. And, 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 and being on that end, um, I bring that up, uh, as, as well, because I know, uh, just directly from my family on history, uh, a history teacher that used to be a friend of my uncle's, um, and uh, and there, um, the amount of slander that they would even say, like, why are you going to Laos? Why would you go to that those brutal countries? Um, you know, they they did this, they did that, and all that. And there was that. And this is a history teacher that teaches high school history. Um, and I won't I, th th that they are still carrying that with them. And and. It, uh, from the Vietnam War and, and from that in that era, and it's like, but you. So they were people... saying they were br brutal to us because yes, exactly that was the issue. Like they're yeah. brutal to us, so we should still be mad at them. We shouldn't yes, go over exactly. there. exactly. Oh, and he was he was a uh, he was in uh, in the uh, Air Force, so he said, "Why are they shooting at us? Why did they keep shooting at us?" Well, you're you're bombing the heck out of their villages, so you know. And I'm not I'm, I don't want to get political, but there was never that terms of coming around to okay. You know, whatever it is, that is the past, and we need to look at now. We understand need to understand what happened there, and then move on from that. And 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 this and this uh, and this uh, boy that had lost his arm and his eyes, uh, as far as his sight, um, and uh, was able to do that. You wait. So the seventeen-year-old had lost his his arm yeah. and his eyes from a, 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 um, a, a, bomb. a an or, ordinance that yeah, came a cluster, cluster bomb later years decades later yeah yeah wow so he, okay. they had picked it up when they're out in the field and it went and uh i mean yeah so there obviously there there's a lot of operations a lot needs to be done to still clear them in, in a lot of areas but so on the religious level but also on these political uh on these political levels and 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 having that kind of understanding then between the people coming together and that realization um it would be healthy because obviously when when this gentleman would go back home he's going to have a different perception on what he talks about which obviously has cha challenged him as well um and it's not it's not about what was right or what was wrong but it's where we are now and how are we moving forward together as a people now um whereas in my uncle's best friend's case he not only has this carries this hate with him but he's teaching that hate to high school students in Minnesota so, and also, I mean, it's also about learning different perspectives and, and, and each country, I'm sure other countries are guilty of this too. Uh, America, certainly as we teach from our own perspective, and that generally means we we're right and they're wrong. And mm -hmm. so when you travel, you learn a wider ex uh, perspective and you understand mm -hmm. that everyone is just doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not these hor specifically they are not these horrible people who are against us. That's not that's just too yep. simplistic. Yes. So, very well, much. Thank you. Very much so. So yeah, it's so important. Uh, okay, so let's talk about your documentary. Yes. Uh, that Dotsie mentioned in the introduction, uh, which is about the dairy industry in Asia. Uh, as, mm -hmm a place where people think cows are revered in so many countries, but tell us the truth. It's kind of like another hidden war that we're just speaking about that's going on Big that time. we don't want to look at. They don't, we don't want to look underneath it um, yeah. to understand. Yeah. Yes. I, um, and, I, and I think we're, and obviously, as we know, we're all guilty of that. Again, I'll, I'll reflect back to where I grew up. <laughs> um, that, uh, but it's still the same, you know, you go to, you go to the supermarket and everything is nicely packaged and it looks very clean and it doesn't look like there's any cruelty footprint at all behind that. I mean, even what it, a lot of times what's used to market that thing is a, if it's, if it's pork ribs, it's a smiling pig with a chef hat or yeah. you know, there's, there's this whole idea of to, to take away the cruelty factor, to not look at the truth. 
Um, and, 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 and India is very much guilty of that as well, as far as, in, as, as the U.S. is, as any country is, as far as that way, on how things are sold, how it's marketed, how it's, you know, um, and, and, and the same there. And, and what we found is, because uh, we even did like some town halls before, but this was during COVID. We made the whole movie during COVID, and our units uh, traveled 20,000 kilometers around uh, India doing interviews uh, and investigative journalism. Um, but we did town halls on Zoom online from uh, different people from different communities, different religious backgrounds, different economic groups, and what how they look at dairy and how they look at how that milk gets on their table, how the curd gets made, how everything, the whole root behind that. And everybody, I would say, yes, I was going to say almost everybody, but I would almost say everybody, I mean, we're looking at like 98%, had a very inaccurate uh, misconception, a very uh, uh, inaccurate perception on how the whole process was. Um, and uh, so based on that, why we did that is because we wanted to say, okay, we want to make sure that in the process of this storytelling that we're going to answer all those questions. Because how many opportunities do you get to do that? So if we get the chance in this one movie, we want to make sure um, that those questions are all answered. And so so we did. Um, and uh, and again, the the whole uh, perception of what, of, or the, the whole uh, ideas of what people believe is how they get their, their dairy and how, who it's benefiting and what actually happens to those cows um, was very skewed um, and very incorrect. And so that this movie based on actually interviews and government data, it's very much government data, public information, but stuff that's just not like shown, you know, it's like, okay, we have it, but we put it in a folder and it, it goes in the back and we'll keep it in the file cabinet. But we actually bring that out of the file cabinet and we say, this is actually what's happening. Um, and we, we brought our cameras from, uh, from the, the, the footage from slaughterhouses, the cameras um, to actual the dairy areas, uh, interviews with uh, small dairy farmers everywhere to actually show what this is the trail of cruelty that is behind it. And, and the cruelty for everyone, I'll say for the environment, for the cows and the buffaloes, but also for the environment, for the farmers, straight down the board. It's a lot of a total exploitation. So. I wanted to um, bring kind of the five parts of the film alive and you to, to talk about them. So it's Maka Dude for yeah. everyone that um, just needs a refresher and can certainly go watch it on YouTube. But it's from the vantage point of the doctor yes. who turns documentarian during COVID for a few years and quits his job as a doctor and embarks yes. on this investigative journey across India. And it, it, it it's, uh, really was initially to find out if there is a link between the nation's India's massive, massive, massive dairy consumption and its beef exports, because yeah. if dairy cows are sacred in India, they don't want to kill them. They're not supposed to kill them as, as it relates to um, the religion. So what was found between oh, wow. the nation's massive dairy consumption and, and also I, I'm, I'm, I am interested in, in you giving our audience at least a bit of a, a purview to the five, it's kind of five parts this film is broken up into. Yeah, the, um, yeah. I mean, the, the connection was more than obvious. And, and I mean, it's so obvious that even people that, that support animal agriculture that I would consider, that we would consider lobbyists for animal agriculture are even saying that there is, like in the West, there's this footprint for beef but there is not that footprint or a very little footprint for beef in India because all the water and that the, the, the water footprint is what I'm talking about. Sorry. The water footprint that goes into the cows, the cows make the milk and then they're slaughtered later for the beef. So they even make the argument that there's very little water footprint for the beef because it's all gone to raise the dairy cattle and the dairy cows. And then those dairy cows produce the milk, which is actually even kind of making the whole conclusion yes because what is happening to all those dairy cows what is happening to the calves what happens to the cows when they cannot give any more milk and some people say oh they go to a gashala now um what's a gashala hold on I'm, I'm a little confused so are you saying that dairy cows become beef cows and that's why there's no imprint because they just blame it on the dairy industry i'm, I'm exactly, not really exactly. Okay. like over here you can drive you know you're out in the country or what have you and you're driving you see the, the beef cattle farms and then you see the dairy farms and Obviously, they do those overlap, but there there is not that. It's it's um, basically the dairy cows become or the offspring of the cows to make the dairy, the calves and everything. They become the beef, uh, the, the the beef, um, and uh, and which makes India 
it's the largest dairy producer in the world, but it's also usually in the top five, sometimes in the top three of beef exporters. Now, people say, oh, that beef means it's just buffalo now because they banned the export of beef. Well, that's debatable because a lot of that is actually going under buffalo meat. And why does that make it any less cruel? I don't Who know. Who banned the export of beef? The, the uh, Indian government has actually put a ban on cow ex exports of beef, cow, and, and certain cows. Now, this is where it gets a little controversial and it gets a very- But, but they're dairy problem. cows that they're exporting for yeah, but, beef. So yes, they were the dairy, raised as beef cows. The dairy industry in India is, is cows and buffaloes. And a lot of it now has been going to buffaloes. Um, but it's, it's still cows are in a major way. And the uh, dairy industry in India, the, the government actually uh, had, had uh, relatively recently made the, uh, the initiative to double their dairy production capacity by 2025. Now, if it met its goals, you're estimating you need about 500 million cows and buffaloes a year producing milk. Um, and obviously, if we can tally, obviously, we all know that the cow or buffalo does not just produce milk without having a calf. So what is happening with those calves? What is happening with those cows when they stop giving milk? And that's, sure, what, is, right. and that's what the journey that uh, Dr. Harsha, who's a, a, a fantastic and passionate activist as well as, uh, as a director. He's, I used to be in the film business as, that we were talking earlier and he's the best director I've actually worked with it's, as far as it's been, it, it's, it's been great working with him. Um, and that connection is just becomes it's like not only undeniable, but it's like highlighted and reinforced by so many things that are happening. So um, where's the, where's the misconception? Is it that we don't eat, we don't kill cows? Is that the we don't, what, kill, what cows. Is the, yes. we don't and, kill cows and we don't mistreat cows? And that's my understanding. That's why yeah. they use wa uh, water buffalo. Is it water buffalo or buffalo? That is yeah, to buffalo. for dairy so that they can supposedly not exploit cows. Yes, uh, there's still a large seed. amount of cows, uh, which we get into depending on the state, are, are still being used. And at the same time, the idea that, that the buffalo should be any less, you know, um, is less intelligent, less emotional, whatever, that they want all the things that are labeled onto the, to the water buffalo is, 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 is false. So yeah, and um, and certain states you can slaughter, certain states you can't. So then there's a lot of uh, cross-border smuggling of the cows to go into others. As far as cows, uh, buffaloes, there's not much protection on them. Actually, I think there's only one state now that it has protection on buffaloes. Um, all the others you can actually, the cows even that are there that are producing milk then are smuggled a lot in and bribes are given, which we show uh, there. Um, and then sadly, there is these uh, vigilante groups that uh, stop those trucks and they beat up the drivers and what have you to rescue the cows. And then they will sit down and have chai uh, milk in their, their tea um, or they're, they're not vegan. And it's like, wait a second, don't you understand what the problem is behind why we have these cows there? And, and there's actually another conclusion. There's, there's quite a few sad conclusions, including that uh, the non-vegetarians are actually cleaning up after the vegetarians in India. Um, and that's because the vegetarian consumption of dairy is really high. The, in general, the consumption of dairy is high in India, but among the vegetarians that don't have other sources of protein or other nutrients, they believe they kind of overcompensate with like paneer and stuff like that. So yeah. it, it, the, 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 the data shows that, that, uh, that the non-vegetarians are actually cleaning up after the amount, the vegetarians, because what else is going to happen with these cows and buffaloes? Um, and the idea that they can go to a Gaushala, Gaushalas don't have money. A lot of them actually end up having to breed, have the cow, have milk, so they can make some money from the milk to help subsidize feeding the cow, which obviously just keeps that, that process going. Um, so, and that's a sanctuary, I'm under, I am under. Yeah, Gaushalas are, are sanctuaries, yeah. And then, of course, there's, sadly, there's little, there's no government subsidies really to go to alternatives, even though they could. They give big subsidies to the dairy, there's big subsidies of for dairy as far as even the taxes that there aren't, aren't on, on their goods and stuff like that. But that doesn't cross over then to plant-based. And, and some people say, well, that could be a conflict, but it's like, look, you have this, these cooperatives, you have these networks in place, you could do the same thing with plant-based alternatives using and working with the same farmers, the same distribution network. So why are we not even talking about a more sustainable way of doing things rather than, than, than this methodology? So, and it, the, the questions that we had in the town halls were something very similar that I think that if we had a town hall here in the United States, you know, the, the you get your protein? 
Yeah, and then, and then even down on the cruelty, like, oh, well, what will happen with all the cows? So if we stop drinking milk, they're going to just, they're, they're, what is going to happen to the population? So it's like, well, there, then similar to here, most of the cows that are giving milk are produced through artificial insemination. So you just stop, produ you just stop producing them that way. I, know. Just, you know, I always tell people, we, do, we'll worry about that. We'll, we'll take, we got it. We're, like, we'll figure it out. We like, no, no problem. What yeah, is, so, yeah. In India, uh, we sort of glorify the small family farm. And uh, here, the big issue, really, the, 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 the most horrendous cruelties happen, I think we can all agree, at the factory farms where there are thousands or tens of thousands of yes. animals packed together. Is that the case in India? Are there large factory farms or is there it mostly not, small? They're not large factory farms. There are, to a certain scale, factory farms. But no, it's mostly small farmers and cooperatives. But even those small farmers are having a difficult time just meeting their costs. And there are several reasons for that, but including that the amount that they are promised to be paid gets cut, cut, cut by the time it gets there. But then they have these cows and what can they do? They have to feed them. They still have to take care of them. So then a lot of them I actually will just let them, um, you know, let them just let them go and to the streets, let them go to the, I mean, when you see a large herds that are rocking around in India, a lot of those, if you look, it's almost all males because they are the male calves and what have you, that they can't even use them for milk. A lot of the farming is not done by the cow doing the plow anymore. You know, it's by machinery, obviously, which makes more sense and is actually becomes more economical. Um, and so a lot of these large herds you'll see walking around are either ca uh, cows that are beyond their, their dairy, dairy giving capacity or they're males, which have, you know, have obviously never been given, uh, have a point of that. Um, so it's, it, it, it is, is that a bad life or a good life wandering around? It's it might a be a life. good life. Oh, no, okay. it's a bad life, sadly, because of uh, many things. But one of the reasons is a lot of the plastics. So the, the conditions that they're, they can't get enough nutrients. A lot of times they're going and they're eating from the plastic, uh, like the dumps where uh, the trash has been dumped on the side before it's picked up. Hi, cat. I like the cat. <laughs> <laughs> it's Simon. Simon, hi, Simon. Says, hi, he's going to come and lie on me. <laughs> hi, um, and, and what? so they, you'll, on, on almost every cat you see on the street, if, if, the, the amount of plastic that they, which eventually kills them, that they have in their, their stomach is, is absurd, absolutely absurd. And yeah. it gets to the point where they, that it obviously their digestion, everything, it just, it, it finishes. There's nothing they can function. So they will be a laying on the side and there are some rescues, but there's no way these rescues can keep up with it. And, and governments realize that it's that bad of a problem to, to the point where they use that as their campaign to, to stop plastic bags. But it's not going to happen. I mean, as much as they're going to try to stop it, they're still going to be that. And that's the, that's the access that these cows are giving. So the ones that are living on the street, it's it's not a good life, as well as other other reasons. Um, they will wander into areas where they're not wanted. Obviously, they go to where the farm, uh, the food is, um, whether it's a farm field or other place, and then they're beaten out. Um, so, I mean, it's it's not an, any close to being an ideal situation. By the fact that you said that many of the male cows are let go, that leads me to believe then that it is the government making the money from the beef, beef exports, not the farmers. They're not yeah. being paid for their male calves to, to sell them to then be exported? No, they, they, they have to sell them, but then finding the buyers and then even being able to sell them in certain uh, states you can't. And then, then there's only so many buyers that can do that because usually in the states that have that, the beef consumption is going to be sometimes will be a lot less. So then you got to send them to the places that won't. So, I mean, there's so depending on the state, it's a state by state thing, but it's very complicated in the sense that a lot of times it's like, well, look, I'm, I'm trying to sell it for slaughter or I don't want to sell it for slaughter. So I'm just going to let it go. Um, so it's it, it, it the, the farmers are actually put in, 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 a, in, a, in a pretty bad predicament. And, and as much as the government likes to say, oh, but we pay this amount. Yeah, but this amount is what you're paying for the, the milk. And this amount is what's getting to the farmer or this amount is what's getting to the farmer, which makes it, from most of the farmers that we talk to, um, it, it's, they're barely getting by. Um, but at the same time, it's also a very difficult life. You Just know, like so you're, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what if people, has the biggest takeaway from this sounds like corruption. Yep. And, and a just, system that's just broken that just doesn't work uh, yeah. in the long run. Yeah, and 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 bad policy that is populist policy uh, um, that that people don't look through enough, sadly, 
because when they say they want to double dairy production, you know, capacity, that I mean, that's like the wrong way to be going. It's like there's a country of one, you have a country of 1.4 billion people anywhere. We have a planet of 8 billion people, but uh, a country of 1.4 billion people, you have environmental concerns, you have water concerns, you have food concerns. The last thing to be doing is to not be looking for alternatives to these industries that are that are that are full of cruelty, but let's put the cruelty part aside. That are just that are just bad for all the things we just mentioned. It's like we got to be thinking further, more long term. And this is not even thinking that long term. I mean, the problem is is to the point where it's it's knocking at the door. So, yeah, no, it's here for sure. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for the education that you're providing people with this documentary. I know it's also come out in the local languages, right? So people, not yes. only it's in, it's in English, but also in local language all around Asia or how, yeah, how do you distribute um, it? The first one we've trans got to translate, not just translated with subtitles, but we actually did the, uh, the voice, the soundtrack and everything is in Hindi. Um, and now we also have another version coming out in uh, Tamil and then another in Telugu. Uh, so the language is in India. Uh, but the Hindi one, which is great, there's like this many viewers compared to the English one. So, I mean, which is fantastic. That's what we want. We want that it to be that uh, our goal is that everyone in India either knows somebody that has seen the movie or has seen the movie themselves, which is why we've put it out there. Uh, we were thinking of a couple of the streaming channels and all that, but we're like, look, uh, the streaming channels, it's a small, very small percent, uh, relatively percentage, relatively of the Indian population that has that. So the only way we could do it is actually just putting it on a, a very free medium that everybody has and everybody has access to. And then we have public screenings that are being happening around the country. And at the end of that, it says, look, um, you know, help us save the cows and buffaloes of India, share this link with your family and friends, have them watch it. So people can go on and just watch the movie for free, which is what we want um, because it's, it's, it's the mission. It's, it's the goal. That's that the only way is if it has an impact that we will feel that the film was a success. So. What is, so what has been the reaction? I mean, I'm sure you've been in a lot of these screenings. Uh, the, 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 I mean, we, to the point where we, we have lost count of the many people that have come out and said, I'm going vegan, or I had no idea. I'm going to cut back. I'm going to go vegan. I, or I got to show this to my, you know, to my parents, or I got to show this to my friends. We had no idea that this is, this is, was the outcome. And this was not the cruelty footprint. Yeah. They don't use the word cruelty footprint, but I'm just kind of abbreviating the cruelty footprint behind the, uh, of, of their milk and their, and, uh, and their dairy. Um, because it's not, I mean, it's it, the the happy images that everybody gives is obviously, as we know, that dairy industry has been doing that everywhere in the world is, uh, yeah, is, 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 is full of falsehoods. So definitely. Good on you. Thank you so much for spreading this all over that country. I think that's, you just, you want to believe this, the fairy tale. You just want to yeah. believe it's so bad. And, but when you, when you look up, it's like, there's, where is this sanctuary that by this point, five, 600 million cows would be on that, yeah. you know, if they're going to live out their life to 20, 22, mm -hmm. you know, it, it doesn't, it, it isn't anywhere. And, and no. that, you know, it's crushing. It's crushing. I think to, for, for certain, to find that out a couple of my neighbors that are from India that yeah. started to unravel this and, and, and unfold it. It's a, it's a, it's a crushing reality because you grow up believing that they're yeah. taken very, very good care of. Um, yeah. every single one of them yeah yeah thank you so much for all your work opening people's eyes through travel and through this documentary through your life and sharing today uh Dossie and I are so happy to have had you on the show tell us where people can find you Zach and and your tours and your doc, well your doc we know is on YouTube on YouTube yeah Mako dude there's an English version and a Hindi version and surprisingly the Indie ver the English version you have to be registered you don't have to register you don't have to have a YouTube account because it's restricted content but it, it is um, so anyhow, if you have a YouTube account, great, if, which is free. If not, then subscribe and then, then you can get access, but the, um, which they oh, didn't do in the Hindi version yet. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, uh, and, uh, so that can be found on YouTube and also you can go to the website at makadud.in. Um, and for, uh, Vegan Travel Asia, it's vegantravelasia.com and also the vegvoyagesfoundation.com. Perfecto. Yeah, and I just want to say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here and to spend this time with you both. I, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. We're thrilled. Hey, folks. Okay, back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate 
fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.